now we have a local historian to provide some interesting historical insights regarding women leaders in the settling of the Sakonet. I'd love to invite Jenna Peterson Magnuski up to the stage. Thank you. Sorry, the COVID protocol. <laughs> Howdy, everybody. <laughs> yep. So, as she said, my name is Jenna Peterson Magnuski. I am a wife and a mother, an active, an active citizen, an educator, and a historian. And most of all, I am one of those nasty women. <laughs> um, as a historian, I believe that knowing our history powers our future. We have a long we have a long history here of powerful women, starting even before this place was called Little Compton. When the English, when the first English colonist came to live in Sakonet in 1674, he met the leader of the local tribe. Her name is lost to time. All that remains is her title, Awashanks, which means she who is queen. Awashanks was tasked with something that was increasingly impossible for indigenous leaders. While she dealt with all of the internal needs and conflicts of her people, as she had for the previous 14 years, she had to devote more and more time to protecting her people and their land from the English. The Sakonet had held out for longer than many other indigenous peoples. Other tribes that went to war with the English, like the Pequot, faced death or enslavement. Just three years earlier, Plymouth Colony had labeled the Sakonet people a rebellious group. It was a dangerous time. Awashanks did the best that she could up to our very last record of her. In 1688, she is requesting farming space for her people, now landless. Because of her role, we know a lot about Awashanks. We don't know as much about the other people in town with indigenous, African, or mixed ancestry. Because they didn't have political or economic power, they often didn't appear in town records. But we do know from research that many of these women found ways to exert power in their own lives. Some simply didn't give their best work. Some did more, ranging all the way up to women like Suki, who self-emancipated. She ran away from her enslaver here in Little Compton one Thursday night in June of 1799. Elizabeth Mortimer Palmer's gravestone is one of the most commonly known stones in the Commons burial ground. It says that she, quote, should have been the wife of Simeon Palmer, leading to these romantic speculations that they had never gotten a chance to get married. But in reality, Elizabeth took their daughter Lydia and left Simeon whose eccentricities had become unbearable. Simeon had her stone engraved in this insulting way because she asserted her power to determine how she and her daughter would live. Yeah, woman power right there. Sarah Sol Wilbur, which is on my pin here, um, was an abolitionist, a suffragist, and an all-around community organizer. She wrote in her journal in April 1889 I fully believe that women are entitled to equal rights as expressed in the Declaration of Independence. I preach the doctrine of equality before the law wherever I go in the highways and byways, at home and abroad. In February 1890, she traveled to Washington, D.C. to attend an, a gala honoring national women's suffrage leader Susan B. Anthony. While there, she attended the meeting that merged two women's national suffrage organizations into one called the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Just rolls right off the tongue. Uh, <laughs> the organization that she saw born was instrumental in, pa in the passage of the 19th Amendment that gave us all the right to vote, though she never got the chance to vote herself. Little Compton summer resident Augusta Maverick Kelly got arrested several times for protesting outside the White House in pursuit of that same right. Susan Allen Brownell, the first woman to hold elected office here in Little Compton was in 1884, well before anybody had the right to vote here, and she was followed by many others. 
Josephine Field Wilbur advocated for a full education for all through high school, transforming generations of Little Compton residents. Lizzie Manchester was a leader in many community organizations, and she also lived her life on her own terms with a man's haircut and men's clothes. Ida Wilbur Smith was seemingly involved with every community organization in addition to running her family's iconic store on the commons, either by herself or in partnership from 1914 to 1985. There are so there are so many more women that I could have mentioned, and none of these women were perfect. Like all of us, they had flaws and growing pains. They might not have agreed with us on many things, yet all of these women shaped who and how we could be, and all of the women here today are a continuation of that inheritance. In the national movement towards suffrage, women organized. They wrote petitions, made speeches, marched, and were arrested. While in prison, women on hunger strike were force-fed. Those force feedings had dire health consequences later in life. They sacrificed so much that, so that today we could have multiple safe ways to cast our ballot. Sarah Sol Wilbur and so many of her compatriots never got the right to vote. In this election, with everything that it holds in the balance, please vote for them. <laughs>